the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point Northern Aquaculture Demonstration Facility in cooperation with the Lac de Flambeau Indian Tribe and Wisconsin Sea Grant presents Pond Culture, an online workshop. This is the second presentation in our Pond Culture series where we will be discussing pond management. To become successful in fish production, a pond manager must understand how to prepare and maintain a safe and productive environment for fish throughout the growing season. For this discussion, we have broken pond management into two basic management practices of maintaining the pond throughout the season. These include pre-season preparation and pond fertilization, which highlights various zooplankton groups, organic and inorganic fertilizers, as well as pond fertilization schedule. These topics must be understood and planned out in advance, some even before the addition of water. For the ease of understanding, we will be generally describing methodology for constructed, drainable, fish-producing ponds. Many of the same items will apply to undrainable ponds, but understand there are some differences in how you handle each type. There are many different resources available that were utilized for these training lectures from published books, videos, and discussions with various pond experts. Deriving information from these sources of professional knowledge and adding personal experience is the best course of action to take while developing your pond management scheme. It is important to understand a pond management scheme that works in one area may not work in other areas. Pond culture is more of an art than a science, and pond management requires the manager to be flexible in their approach. The concepts and information presented in this workshop should be used as a guideline. Individual management practices must be developed for specific ponds or specific farms based on personal experience and pond attributes. The first step in managing ponds is the preparation. Natural and constructed ponds need to be managed differently for drainable ponds, before adding water to a pond, it is important to make sure the bottom and the sides of the pond are prepared for fertilizers, water, and eventually for fish. This can be done preferably in the fall, but could also be done in the spring, weather permitting. To prepare clay-lined ponds, a good practice is to dry, disc, and roll the bottom of the pond to promote aerobic breakdown of nutrient-rich sediment if this is needed. This is especially important for older or impermeable ponds. Drying the pond stabilizes the pond substrate, reduces aquatic vegetation growth, aids in disease control, reduces aquatic predators, and facilitates the oxidation of accumulated fecal material and any excess feed that may be in the pond. Some pond operators apply aquazine to control aquatic vegetation before filling ponds with water. While the pond is dry, it is a good time to remove and repair any aeration equipment to prepare for the following season. In addition, any repairs or other infrastructure items such as piping, fencing, or predator control measures can be made at this time. If ponds are left dry for over several months, erosion of the banks may become an issue. Seeding around the edges with ryegrass is a good practice to limit this problem. When the pond is ready to be filled, it can be flooded, which can also provide a good source of organic fertilizer. Rock rip around the edges is also a possible erosion stopping technique. Repair of any predator netting or frog fencing around the ponds during the off season is also important. Remove and repair aeration equipment such as diffusers and hoses. Make sure all the drain and water supply lines are drained for the winter and checked in the spring. Repair, repair and replace if necessary. For lined ponds, the plastic or rubber may need to be brushed and hosed down or repaired at the end of the season. This picture depicts a crew cleaning a lined pond at the Rathbun State Fish Hatchery in Iowa. 
If your facility has harvest kettles or sedimentation basins, they need to be cleaned before the next production season. Stop logs, screens, graters, valves, nets, seines, and other equipment may need to be repaired or replaced. Undrainable ponds need to be treated to remove any unwanted fish, aquatic organisms, and vegetation. It is imperative to remove any residual fish as they can cannibalize introduced fry, leaving you with very little production. This can be a costly endeavor and not always successful. Some commercial operations only use winter kill lakes and ponds for this reason. A common treatment option is rotenone, but permitting may be required. After preseason preparation, the next step for fish production is pond fertilization. Why fertilize? This is done to increase fish production by increasing the quality and quantity of food organisms within a pond. The food cycle begins when fertilizers are applied to the pond. Bacteria then break down and release nutrients within the fertilizers. These nutrients then stimulate phytoplankton growth, reproduction, which are food for zooplankton and other organisms. Depending on the species, both the phytoplankton and zooplankton are then food for fry and fingerlings. To complete the cycle, applied fertilizer and fish waste will again be broken down by the bacteria and it creates nutrients. The pond response can be unpredictable, which is why many factors must be considered before fertilizing a pond, which we will discuss next. Food webs within a pond system can be very complex. This diagram is showing just how intermingled the factors can be. It is important to understand that management of a pond is managing not one factor, but many together. Simply put, the role of the pond manager early on is to promote the growth and development of the correct size and species of zooplankton prey for fish fry to achieve production goals. Pond management and fertilization rates are determined by science and art. Experience helps as well. Usually larval fish will begin eating rotifers as a first food source. As fish grow, food source changes to copepods and endoclodocerins, which are also known as daphnia. We will show this in more detail in the next slide. This table explains a few common zooplankton groups and important information such as body length, lifespan, and the size food they consume. For example, we can see that rotifers are very small. 0.04 to 2.5 millimeters in length, and that they would provide a good first forage for yellow perch and for walleyes. But as the fish grow, they will search out larger diet items such as cladocerins or copepods. As a pond manager, it is important to recognize exactly what you are providing to your fish at specific times in your ponds. And understanding Zooplankton is essential to becoming a good pond manager. This slide shows sizes of some common pond reared fish. It is important to match the hatch, meaning match the feed in your pond to the size of the fish you are rearing at specific times. For example, a bass fry will need a first forage of very small rotifers, whereas a catfish may never consume rotifers and may be foraging for larger zooplankton like cladocerins or copepods as an initial food source. Again, this goes back to the biology of the fish that you are rearing and the best ways to manage that species. The first important food source for small fry are the rotifer group of zooplankton. Female rotifers are asexual or parthenogenic meaning they produce diploid eggs, which without fertilization can develop into adults. With high fecundity and short development, 
Rotifers are very prolific within a pond given appropriate water quality and food. The next important food source for young fry are copepods. Though there are thousands of species worldwide, the subclasses of Caledonia and Cyclopedia are of an interest for pond production. Unlike rotifers, copepods undergo only sexual reproduction <clears throat> and may take a month or more to complete their reproductive cycle. Eggs hatch first into noplii and develop into various stages before becoming an adult. Adults range from 1 to 5 millimeters in length and under ideal conditions can live up to six months or even a year. Copepods are an important food source for young fish due to the high range of sizes and high protein content they provide. This slide shows the life stages of the copepod from anoplei to adult. Notice how the young stages have little to no resemblance to the adult stage. The third group of important zooplankton are the cladocerans, also known as the water flea or daphnia. There are hundreds of species recognized in the order Cladocera, with many more to be identified. Similar to rotifers, the females are parthenogenic, producing amictic eggs which will develop without fertilization, creating all female clones. Although mostly asexual when fa favorable conditions exist, Cladocerans may also undergo sexual reproduction when conditions become harsh. At this time, males are created to fertilize resting eggs known as an epiphium, which allows survival of the species. As a fish farmer, it is important to recognize this change in zooplankton life cycles. If many epiphiums are observed in the plankton sample, it is assumed that the pond environment has changed, conditions may have become harsh. Appropriate action should be taken at this time, such as a full water quality analysis to determine the issue. Daphnia range in size from 0.2 to 5 millimeter in length and are important for the next size feed for small fish. Zooplankton population trends in ponds start with fast growing and multiplying rotifers and proceeds to cladocerans and copepods. Although copepods are the next food source for young fry, as the graph shows, their populations may take a month or more to develop within a pond. This population trend shows how proper timing is important to remember when managing food sources for your fry. In order to develop a healthy fish population, you have to manage all parts of the food web. You cannot maintain your zooplankton population if your phytoplankton population crashes. <clears throat> if this happens, fish production will be negatively impacted. This relationship can be understood as a hierarchy in the pyramid. If either zooplankton or phytoplankton levels drop, your fish will be negatively affected. The top-down and bottom-up effects are essentially driven by the sun. Your production will depend on the number of sunny, warm days you have during the production season. Growing degree days applies to fish culture just the same as it does in corn, potato, and soybean production. Sampling of plankton is necessary to know what is available to your fish. This can be done using a Wisconsin plankton net, which is most common. It can also be done with a tube sampler, pumps, or even a visual sample. Timing is most important for this management practice. It is recommended to sample prior to stocking fry as well as each week afterwards. Planning is crucial to provide a good food source for young fry, so be sure to prepare your ponds with accurate levels of zooplankton before fry are stocked. Regular, consistent sampling will allow you to quantify and know what pop plankton stage your pond is in and if the fish are getting the correct sizes of plankton. Good zooplankton levels and appropriate variety are the result of good fertilization application and techniques which we will describe next. There are two general types of fertilizers used to enhance pond productivity. 
organic and inorganic. First, let's discuss organic. Fertilizers considered organic generally include composted plant material or manure that contain high amounts of nitrogen and organic carbon. Typically, alfalfa meal, soybean meal, green manure, or animal manure is used as a source of organic fertilizer in ponds. These fertilizers slowly release nutrients over a period of time which are utilized by phytoplankton. Additionally, decomposition of the fertilizer also stimulates heterotrophic bacteria which can be consumed by zooplankton. Organic fertilizers can be especially useful for new or sterile ponds to assist in developing food webs. Organic fertilization is considered the traditional form of fertilizing a pond and has been used for centuries for many species of fish. There are a variety of organic fertilizers available on the market. It is important to understand the balance of elements within each. Note the difference in nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium levels shown in these examples. Understanding your fertilizer nutrient content will help to determine how often, how much, and when to use based on your pond needs. A simplified version of the heterotrophic food web as organic fertilizers are applied is shown here. Organic fertilizers stimulate heterotrophic food chains and the organic materials generate a large decomposer community which can be consumed by zooplankton and yet also provide a slow release of inorganic nutrients to algae or phytoplankton, thus increasing productivity of your pond. In summary, here are a few pros and cons of organic fertilizers. Organic fertilizers slowly release nutrients, stimulating a steady increase in phytoplankton levels. The decomposition also stimulates heterotrophic food webs which in turn feeds important food fish organisms. This process also leads to increased coronamid production, which is very important for walleyes in the second half of the pond culture period. Alfalfa meal may have a higher nutritional value to zooplankton and coronamid larvae as well. Often, culturalists utilize a mixture of soybean meal, alfalfa meal, and terula yeast for fertilizing their ponds. Organic fertilization is considered the traditional form of fertilizing a pond and has been used for centuries. On the downside, organic fertilizers also have a few disadvantages including their cost. They are more expensive and require higher labor costs than inorganic fertilizers for pond application. They also may lead to oxygen deprivation in a pond as well as stimulating filamentous algae growth which can entangle fish and quickly take over a pond. It is important to understand both the pros and cons as you select your fertilizers for your pond. Another way to fertilize a pond is with inorganic fertilizers. These are man-made chemical solutions or pellets specifically containing precise elements utilized by autotrophic food chain which is driven by sunlight. Similar to what you would buy for fertilizing your yard, managing a pond for a 20 to 1 nitrogen to phosphorus ratio is common when utilizing inorganics. This slide compares the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in a variety of inorganic fertilizers. Notice how each fertilizer specifically targets one element as a nutrient. Inorganic fertilizers can be immediate sources of micro and macronutrients which stimulate algae growth, control water hardness, and buffer pH. Inorganic fertilizers generally are cheaper and require less labor than organic fertilizers. A disadvantage to using these fertilizers is that not all the elements may be effectively dissolved and therefore cannot be taken up by the plants and are essentially wasted. Phosphorus, for example, will not remain in pond water solution for very long 
before it collects at the bottom of the pond. Here it may become bound in insoluble compounds and no longer available to plants. Inorganic fertilizers may also lead to an abundance of filamentous algae, which is problematic for harvest, fish entanglement, and disrupts pond productivity. The use of organic versus inorganic fertilizers are promoted by different groups and there has been much debate concerning which one is best. When considering the advantages and disadvantage of organic versus inorganic fertilizers, it may be beneficial to combine them. Whether to use inorganic, organic, or a combination depends on the situation of an individual pond. This includes species reared, time of year, cost, the availability of a product, the production cycle of that pond, and past experience. With that said, combining both inorganic and organic fertilizers is a common practice in ponds, usually by benefiting from the use of both fertilizers, higher production rates are seen. By combining fertilizers, pond managers also seem to benefit by being able to fine-tune their fertilization regime for specific ponds, for time of year, and for related weather conditions. It is important to remember there are general guidelines available for combining and applying fertilizers, but these definitely do not apply to every pond. Each pond is different, and will require an understanding of factors involved in pond response to fertilization in order to see the high production rates. Both UWSP and ADF and the Lactoflamble tribe use a mixture of both organic and inorganic at specific rates based on various factors for clay line ponds or for plastic line ponds respectively. There are a wide range of both physical and biological factors that may affect a pond's response to fertilization. Physical factors may include area and depth of the pond, shoreline area and characteristics, rate of water exchange, turbidity, water temperature, sunlight, wind action, and many others. The biological factors to consider are the plant and animal life existing in the pond as well as the food habits of the fish species that will be raised. Chemically, factors to be considered may be the elements within the pond, the composition of the sediment, as well as the pH, hardness, alkalinity, and chemical interactions that may have significant effects on fertilizer response. It is also important to understand the surrounding environment and the effects it will have on your pond. Concerns may be agricultural communities with runoff, watershed, and different soil types. Understanding how your pond works is imperative to being a good pond manager and also being able to raise fish in the ponds successfully. So how much fertilizer should you use for your pond? A target nitrogen to phosphorus ratio to shoot for is around 20 to 1 by weight. This is generally a good balance of nutrients for a pond. If your ratio is decreased from this target, filamentous algae may become an issue. On the other hand, if your ratio increases from the target, macrophytes or rooted plants may become an issue. We like to recommend about 6 pounds of nitrogen and 0.3 pounds of phosphorus per acre. However, in older or more established ponds, phosphorus may build up in the substrate or vegetation. Therefore, additional amounts may not be needed. If possible, monitoring both nitrogen and phosphorus is important to achieve the correct ratio. Here is the typical NADF pond fertilization schedule for fertilizing our half acre drainable clay lined ponds. Generally, 40 pounds of alfalfa or soybean meal is used to spread along the bottom of the pond before filling. We usually start filling our ponds with fresh water and fertilizer approximately 10 days before we plan on stocking fry, weather depending. We only fill the pond a quarter of the way to begin and then we add about 18 pounds of liquid urea and one pound of phosphorus. 
Water is slowly added over the course of the first rearing period as the temperature in the pond and the ambient air temperature increases. During this period, fertilizer is applied every week or as needed based on seshi disc and plankton levels. Adding additional organic fertilizers of about 100 pounds of alfalfa or soybean meal and 3 pounds urea with 0.5 pounds of phosphorus is applied throughout the early rearing season. After the fish are about a month old or around 1.5 inches, they will be searching out larger food sources such as minnows and fertilization can discontinue. The most effective pond managers will develop programs that are very site specific to their ponds in order to optimize fertilization rates and schedules to promote good plankton growth and production, thus increasing fish yield. Sometimes a fertilization plan is pond specific, even if there are multiple ponds at the same farm or fertilizer, excuse me, facility. Keep in mind, your production results may vary from pond to pond, even though you are fertilizing at the same rate. This fertilization schedule that is provided is specific to the size, location, and other factors affecting our ponds at NADF. This schedule may not apply to your ponds and is simply an example. We encourage you to create your own schedule that works well for your specific ponds. Organic and inorganic fertilizers are applied differently to ponds. Organic fertilizers need to be spread around the pond edge by hand or apply, applied across the pond by boat. This can be difficult and labor intensive. Most organic fertilizers are of very fine material. We recommend fertilizing organics on a calm day or using the wind to your advantage, spreading the material with the wind to travel across the pond. There are a variety of different inorganic fertilizers as liquid, powder, and granular. Liquid fertilizers can be mixed into a prop wash or mixed with water for a 10 to 1 ratio then sprayed across the pond. The powder can be blown onto the pond surface. The granular fertilizers may be difficult to dissolve in water, therefore using warm water to create a solution which then can be sprayed onto the pond is advantageous. For any application, it is important to be consistent across the area of your pond. Do not apply all at once or in one area. Fertilization should be applied when weather conditions will be sunny and warm for consecutive days afterward. And oxygen levels should be monitored and maintained at safe levels during and after all fertilization events. Let's summarize what we've discussed regarding the fertilization process. The first and most important is planning. Be sure to plan ahead for your incoming fry, even before your pond is filled. Make sure that your fry will have a stable food source before they are stocked into the pond. It is also important to maintain and continue to fertilize for at least four weeks or as long as zooplankton is needed and your water quality will allow. Remember that there is a bottom-up effect in a pond and that everything begins with sunlight and nutrients to promote phytoplankton levels. This has a direct effect on zooplankton levels, which is the food source for your fry. Your production can be positively or negatively affected by a change in any of these trophic levels. To help understand what is occurring in your pond, regular and consistent sampling of the water quality and plankton levels is a must. Lastly, it is important to remember that what works for one pond may not work for another pond. There are many factors that may affect a pond's response to fertilizers. Every good pond manager will have their own recipe for production. This comes with the experience of raising fish in your pond specifically. This concludes the second module of the Pond Culture Workshop. We would like to acknowledge the resources and professionals that have provided information utilized for this module. We hope this helps you become a more effective pond manager. This module is meant to be an introduction to preparation and fertilization of pond culture management and is a prerequisite for further training.
Thank you for your attention. Please continue to the third Pond Culture module on water quality.